Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. And today we have four great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story. Customer quality engineer's terrible trip leads to a costly tipping dispute, changing their loyalty to corporate policies forever. The second story. When a company denies full moving reimbursement, HR follows policy to the letter and pays them an additional $4,800. The third story. Unscrupulous apartment wrongly demands money, fails to proofread lease, receives six quarters instead of full amount. The fourth story. New manager enforces excessive car park patrols, leading to delayed response and costly incident. Policy reverted after manager's departure. On to the first story. Most expensive tip ever. Nearly 15 years ago, I went to work for a company. The intent was for me to complete a project in quality and then move over into a program management, but someone quit and I was asked to fill in as a customer quality engineer. This meant that every month, I traveled to customer sites, did the first pass analysis of our defective products and got yelled at a lot. It sucked. Also worth mentioning, our branch of the company was too small to use the corporate travel, so for every trip I was scouring discount travel sites to find the cheapest flight, hotel, and car. I was ridiculously vigorous in seeking best prices. H's SH box car was $32 a day, and the not-so SH car was $34 a day. I picked the $32 a day car to save the company $2 a day. One fine trip, several months in, was spectacularly awful. Not only did I have a truly terrible car, the hotel was all new depths of yuck. My shoes stuck to the carpet in my room, and the security flipper thing on the door was plastic. Also, it was in the worst part of town, and I worried about my safety to the point that I ended up pulling the little couch over to block the door and sleeping on it. Adding to my misery, I was sick. I had some creeping crud that plugged my sinuses and made me long for death. Normally, I'd have canceled the trip, but the customer was in an uproar about our continued repeating defects and required someone to be there. I made this trek every month, and once during every trip, I would eat at the local Outback Steakhouse. It was a known quantity. The people who worked there were great, and it helped me to have that connection. On this particular trip, I made my way to the Outback for dinner, and I was clearly sick and miserable. And the workers took care of me. They sat me next to the fire, brought me tea, and had the kitchen make me chicken noodle soup, even though it wasn't on the menu. I nearly cried, I was so grateful. My bill for dinner was less than $10, so I charged $20. Yes, more than a 100% tip, but their kindness kept me going. I got home, did my expense report, and turned it in. My director called me into his office and screamed at me about how the corporate policy was 10% tip, and it should never exceed 15%, and what was wrong with me for paying them so much. Remember, total bill including excessive tip was $20. It broke me. Well, it shattered my loyalty to the company's bottom line. So I made them give me the corporate travel policy where the tip policy was outlined, and from that moment on I followed the corporate travel policy exactly. No more SH box $32 a day cars. I'm in midsize or better. No more flying out at 4 a.m. in the center seat. The flights fit my schedule and I sat where I wanted. No more scary hotels in the worst part of town. Now I'm staying at the nicest executive hotel allowed by the policy. The cost of my trips were pretty regularly double or triple what they had been adding up to thousands of dollars a year, but I never disobeyed their allowable tip policy again. The true irony, their corporate tip policy actually had verbiage that said exceptional service could be recognized, with an additional gratuity, but basically don't make a habit of it. Also, the allowable per diem was $50 a day, and a receipt was only required if over that amount, so the tip that started the whole thing was within per diem, allowable for exceptional service, and the receipt for it had not been necessary. The next story is... Company policy outranks a written contract? Okay, we'll stick to policy then. Early last year, my wife got a promotion, which required moving across the state. Her company offered a very generous moving package which was formally written up in a contract, which we had to sign and agree to before the promotion was official. One of the big draws was that the contract said it would pay for all closing costs and related fees for not only the sale of our previous house, but the purchase of our new house in our new city. I was a little dubious and had my wife clarify as their associated fees, due at closing, which aren't really sale fees, such as your prepaid homeowner's insurance for the year, taxes, and HOA fees. But the contract said all fees and the HR specialist reiterated this so we were happy. 
Cut to a few months later. We've moved, rented short term, found a new home, closed and moved into it. The final reimbursement check comes, and it's about $1,000 short for all of our prepaids. I wasn't shocked, but I double checked the contract and yep, clear as day, all fees was included. So my wife reached out to the HR moving supervisor to check on this and she was pretty curtly told that we had been misled and that company policy was only to pay closing costs themselves and all fees just meant closing cost fees. That's always been company policy. We were told and the contract wasn't literal on all fees. This went back and forth for a day. My wife politely escalated it and we did get a sympathetic HR director, but policy was policy, so her hands were tied. Here's the malicious compliance though. While company policies said we couldn't get the prepaid fees reimbursed, she, the HR director, asked for all of our moving and rental receipts, as company policy does state that those would be paid. The HR director poured over our receipts and all for another day and reached back out with a formal letter which said, sorry, company policy doesn't allow prepaid reimbursement, so you won't get your $1,000. But I did find that you weren't adequately reimbursed for your move and short-term rental per company policy, and we've submitted a claim to you for that amount. Another day later and we got a check for $5,800. We just wanted them to honor the contract, but following company policy to the letter got us another $4,800. We didn't realize we were owed, so I'd say it worked out in the end. Edit. To answer a common question about being owed the $1,000 per the contract, what we were told is that the contract we signed was supposed to have a company policy addendum, which had the definitions, and all other fees is defined in that as excluding prepaids, insurance, etc. So someone did goof by A, not sending us that, and B, telling us that stuff was included. So while we could have hassled for that $1,000, it wouldn't be worth the time, fees, or money, especially when the company has been above and beyond for my wife on everything else. Good raises, great benefits, great boss, constantly training her on things she asks to learn, etc. We've also learned from experience that small claims court isn't always the way to go. TLDR, property manager from the rental during this move effed us out of $1,800 ignored our lawyers. I had to F them by calling them out on a website since court wasn't worth it. The rental situation. It was perfect and it was hell. Perfect in that we were super lucky to find a nice house in a nice neighborhood that would take four pets, three cats and one dog, on super short notice for a three month rental. Property manager was wonderful while we lived there. Hell in that it was a big pain in the A to not get back our $1,800 security deposit after and to have to get lawyers involved and spend all the money on that but we're getting paid back now, so it's working out. The third story is, get in losers, we're complying maliciously. We all do stupid stuff in our 20s. Well, for me, it was moving into a shoddy apartment with my fellow mental health risk friend. We were both well aware that we may have to break lease at some point, so we found an apartment that was just barely within price range and had the option to break the lease early. It was okay at first. There was linoleum peeling up in the bathroom, and if we didn't wipe down the window sills and particularly the far corner ceiling of my bedroom, then we would get mold. But this is Oregon, and as a food stamp family as I was called in school, I'm familiar with mold. No biggie. Then our washer, which we were paying an extra $100 a month to have in our unit, started leaking. We put in a maintenance request and tack on the peeling linoleum as well, since they'd already be in the unit to fix the washer. They patched up the washer and did a half a job repairing the patch of linoleum. A month later, the linoleum, since they had not actually fixed the underlying problem of the peeling linoleum, it had come up again. The corner sliced my foot open, and the bathroom sink, washer and dishwasher all had problems of one kind or another. They came in again and said that if we wanted them to fix that patch, again, it would cost $450 to replace the whole floor. The patch was like a two-foot square, so that just never got repaired. Two months, three hospital trips for my ex-roommate, a still broken dishwasher that was unusable, a leaky washer and a close call later, roommate has POTS, fell down the stairs. We put in a request for accommodation to be released to our respected parents on the grounds of mental and physical disability. They denied the request, simply offering to move us to a downstairs apartment. They don't want to let us out of this lease even though my roommate had almost cracked her head on the stairs? Fine. Malicious compliance incoming. I went through the lease agreement to figure out how much it would be to break the lease. And I quote, fee to break this lease is 150, 1 1.5 times rent if left blank. Someone either messed up the paperwork or figured that no one would read it. So I put in a 30 day notice of intent to move out with 150 worth of quarters in the envelope. Aftermath, they tried to tell us we couldn't move out because it's 1.5 times the rent, not 150. Threatened us with lawyers, called their bluff, suggested they reread the lease agreement they signed 
paid my half of the repairs and haven't heard from them in like three months. Still keeping all the emails and such in case I get a letter from a lawyer. Still have zero intention to pay that. 1.5 times rent. Edit. You get mold because of poor ventilation. Moisture in the air condenses on the cold spots instead of being vented outside. Yeah, and most of the places I've lived have had bad ventilation, huh? When we moved into our current house with great ventilation, and I found out about how mold actually works, it blew my mind that it isn't just a thing everyone has to deal with. The fourth story is... You want me to patrol each park? Fine by me. This comes from back when I was working security in a local hospital. The hospital itself was made of main building, AE slash minors and wards, estate offices, old ambulance station, the maternity ward, and a management house, which would house all the upper management while they worked. Around the building were car parks. We had three in total ranging from large to only a couple of spaces, but still a wide area. It would take around 30 to 40 minutes to check all the car parks and take 10 to 15 minutes to get to one side of the site edge to the other. Our security office was located just outside of A&E, as believe it or not, but that was where most of the trouble was, which called for security to be there. As a fairly small hospital, there was only maximum of three security on each eight hour shift. Security management could help, but often didn't want to get involved. We were doing our normal patrols of once every 30 minutes to go around each of the wards, which kept us quite busy if nothing was happening that day on shift. One day a nurse complained to the security manager that we needed to be more visible around the car parks to stop break-ins. We don't often patrol the car parks as it's park at your own risk, as the site was lacking funds for extra security. Our manager understood this, which is why it just stayed as it was due to the security team needing to stay in the wards, and A&E to protect staff and patients. Six months go by and our manager leaves. He's replaced with a new manager which hears the same complaints as the first one and orders us to start patrolling each and every car park and ward on our rounds. Needless to say, we just agreed and said okay. Please note I know this would not end well, but I complied with my new orders, and every day without fail walked around all the car parks even if it was half or nearly empty. Fast forward another week or two, and A&E radioed us to attend as a patient was threatening staff. However, security officers were on the back car park roughly 5-10 to 10 minutes away even when running. Please note that was another rule that we had to stay in twos as we were only MAPA trained, and it needed two minimum. By the time we got there, this patient had already hit out to staff causing injury, but also decided to run around A&E department and other joining areas breaking glass windows and scaring others. We controlled the situation after getting there, but it was already too late. A thousand pounds worth of damage caused in a couple with small injuries. Later on, new manager asked why our response time was so slow. We just replied by saying we were taking care of the car parks like ordered to by you. The day after, more signs went up saying park at your own risk and were never ordered to patrol half-empty car parks again. New manager only lasted about four or five months after this incident. Edit. The story's from a few years ago now, but while I was there on staff, we were crying out for new staff to even have four out of five on staff, so car parks and inside can be covered both at the same time. I don't think it's a lack of funding, more to do with irresponsible spending by the hospital, as we once paid for crap metal to be removed from site, even though they would have then it for free as they get paid at the skipyard as well. Edit 2. The trust problem was that most of the security guards on site were just taken from other departments in the hospital. No real experience, so what would happen is they would be fine for a couple months. Then a major incident will arise and next minute they're walking out and leaving. Which is fine, but that meant a high rate of turnover. Which in security doesn't help as you need to trust the person slash people your own shift with to do the right thing and back you up. Edit 2. Management in that department was always weak. All five years I was at the hospital working. Most took the approach of hands off, but mangled with the general staff to make it seem like their presence was also there. Don't know what that manager does now, but I would like to think he had warnings for not helping more in many different incidents, including this one. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new video comes out, and hit the like button to support the channel.